I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. Today, I interview Kalade Paul Ajuape, who's a missionary to Eastern Europe and a recent graduate of MIT. Listen as he shares about his experiences on the mission field and his dream to go to Japan. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. I just got back from a church planting conference. It was called the Exponential Conference. It was held in the Bay Area. I was able to stay with some friends of mine, Brock and Ann Roby, who lead a church there in the Bay Area. It was great. It was really good. It was um, sponsored by a, a different church organization that what I'm a part of, but it was just great to learn different things. And I'm going to do a separate episode on what I picked up from that conference. But I think it's always good to try to just go to different places, different sources, and try to learn other things and find out what are people doing. And it was really interesting, covered a whole range of different things, micro churches, traditional churches, calling people to to really extend themselves to multiply, multiply more churches. So I think that's really valuable. And Look forward to talking more about it. And I really appreciate you taking the time today to listen to the podcast. If you feel like you're you're benefiting from it, I'd like to ask you to support it with a gift because your support enables me to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches and inspire others to do the same through this podcast. People like Melanie Yu, Bruce and Rachel Erickson, um, others have, have sponsored me on the program. Basically, that it paid for the trip to go to San Francisco and go to the conference and pick up other ideas on how to multiply churches. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the support from all those who've really helped support the program because that's not in my church budget, but it helps me to do things that benefit the kingdom on a broader scale. All you need to do is go to the show notes and there's a link to support the program. Kaladay, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? I grew up in England, but before that, I was born in America, and I lived in Nigeria till I was four years old. As a baby, I moved back to Nigeria, where all my family lived. I lived there till I was four, and then England when I was four. Lived in London for a year, and then I lived in Bournemouth, which is where I was, like 13 years of my life. And um, I grew up like church. I had very like religious, spiritual parents who took me to church four times a week. And um, actually, my my mom and dad were actually converted. My dad in Nigeria in the Lagos Church, and my mom in London in the London Church. And they came together in Nigeria, met, got married to England. I actually didn't go to an ICOC church and so growing up I went to a church and um, I still had very good like foundational principles um, but um, yeah my life was kind of like I tried to look like a Christian but I was um, yeah kind of just living very a very worldly life yeah does that answer your question okay so you're your mom, did she, did she go on the mission team to to Lagos from England? Is that how she met your dad, or was she? Yeah, so she, so my both my parents are Nigerian, and so my mom in London, she was a student. I see um, at university, and uh, she worked. A, she got met on a on, on the underground at the, the train station. <laughs> I think you didn't became cool, and um, like. A few years, I think like a year earlier, my dad was in Nigeria. He got reached out to by a colleague. And then my mom went back to Nigeria and both in the Lagos church at the same time. 
and that's how they met. Wow. Okay. So then you guys moved to back to England from Nigeria when you were four, and then but you weren't a part of the the ICOC church in England. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't. Was that after like two thousand three? Was there like? It, it pretty much was like when I was four. It was two thousand and four, um, and I was for a year. But when we moved away we were around uh, like a little over two hours away from this church and so i think for the sake i have two siblings and i think i know that he wasn't he didn't have like a residency in england so he would come back and forth so it was really pretty much just my mom taking us and i think sometimes she to london but after a while it became just staying in going to the nearest church that we had she felt was good and had like a good kids kingdom and so that was kind of but it wasn't in an ICC um ministry got it okay so then you're raised in a in like a was it a church of england church of kind of church was it is it from what i remember i remember going to a lot of different churches actually <laughs> but I, the one we spent most of our time at was a baptist church and um it was great. Like I remember friends being there, like we played football all the time. Hmm. We did plays, like it was cool actually. And I definitely say, would say that I, I understood the scripture and I understood who, who God was, but I, it, I didn't understand it in the way. I, I don't think I was ever called to change my life because of it. I think that's what I need. Got it. So, for those of us who are not familiar with the geography of England, what was the name of the town you're in and wh- where, where is it located? Yeah. So the town is, um, we one, have a, one more time. You, you buffered out there. I didn't catch that. Yeah. The town is called Bourne. It's like Jason Bourne, Bourne, and then Muth, like Dartmouth, spelled the same, like it's pronounced Bournemouth. Bournemouth. Okay. And it's in a, it's in a, of England. So you go directly down from London and then you go west. Oh, yeah, and you go west, like when you reach the coast. And so we have like a beach and it's really nice. Like I recommend anyone you come to England, come to Bournemouth. Bournemouth <laughs> really underrated. Okay. Great. So really, you are, you're a man of the world. I mean, US by US citizenship by birth then you have citizenship in nigeria as well T- tell me a little bit about that yeah so i have citizenship in nigeria because both of my parents are nigerian okay and because i i lived there for four years as a child um so all of uh, all of my siblings have you know, all of us have nigerian passports yeah and then i also have the citizenship in in Great Britain, mm-hmm. wow. UK. Okay, so I think you said you have three passports, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's handy. That's really really nice. That's fantastic. Okay, so how did you end up getting to MIT? Yeah, so I would say I mean it's a great great story. Of how so I was born in America and I got the opportunity. Uh, thank God I family to go visit like all Orlando Studios, Disneyland, like a couple of times. And I kind of had this like view, like a lot of Europeans have this view of America. Like this place is so cool. And because I was born there, I had the passport. I felt like there's part of me is here. And so I think that played into my desire to go to America. And I remember watching legally Legally Blonde is this movie. Maybe you've seen, seen. Reese Witherspoon. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And she studied law. Like she had this to study law at Harvard. Right. And I remember watching that as a child and being like, oh, I, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to study law at Harvard. Like I thought that was a really like prestige thing. I ended up not wanting to do law, but the, the dream for like getting into a prestigious university into America, that was kind of like a big dream for me. And so um, I applied to a lot of school 
Africa. And I wasn't going to apply to MIT because I, I genuinely did not think it was like, in. and I remember like just filling out all these applications and my dad just telling me I at MIT and the, the cost of an application is around $80. And I just felt like just the money, like, why would you, he's like, don't worry. I will, I will pay for it. Like, it's going to, like you just apply and somehow like it was my first interview I was just like yeah let me just use this as a this and yeah long story short I I think on God's will now I know it was God's will that I got in there because being there allowed me to become a disciple so it was definitely God just paving the way for me to come to know him for sure yeah okay that's that's amazing that's a tough school to get into how did you become a Christian? Interestingly, I didn't grow up in a, like I told you I didn't grow up in an ICOC, but um, around when I was 16, 17, another family from church, they had been living um, close to our town, the town over. They decided that they would start a house church. And so um, I was around 16 years. They invited my family who, so yeah, my family, my mum was a, my dad, he was coming back and forth. So he wasn't really there. But then we started doing a house. It was just us, two, our two families. I went from being in this huge church with lots to just being my family and their family. It was quite strange at the time. Um, but that was my first introduction to the ICOC. And when I got to college, I got um, invited to I got connected with our campus minister, Jesse Goman. And I remember in those first two weeks, Jesse kept reaching, messaging me. And I was kind of just, I wanted to make friends. I just wanted to fit in. And I saw Jesse's like reaching out was like, I'm going to get to that, but not right now. And so I kind of delved into, I, I continued living that, that life of just justification and, and sin. And I remember um, I was just, yeah, getting drunk and doing all these things. And it, it came down to the second semester. And um, I had not gone to the ICC. Like, I, I kind of stopped speaking with Jesse after the first three weeks. And um, I would go to this other church, like, once every other week about. And uh, I was a close church, and some of my friends went to it. I remember being, wait, being on the sidewalk waiting for Jesse to take us to church because it was cold. And we didn't want to walk. And I remember just kind of boasting friends about this relationship, these, these relationships I'd had with different. And my friend who he's normally would be like high-fiving me or like cheering me like this. And for some reason in that moment, he said, hey, you know what you're doing is a sin? Like some, something, and he's not even, he's not a disciple. And he's, he's, yeah, he just, spoke through him they're just like bro you know what you're doing is a sin and i remember sitting in church that day thinking like well if jesus comes back today i'm not right with him a about a week after my friend josh um he was on his way to bible discussion doing homework in the room right next to where they had their bible discussions and um, i that they even had bible discussions and he he came he asked me if i wanted to join and on this, I was like, I should probably join. I ended up joining. They announced there was a retreat coming up. The second event I went to was this campus retreat. Um, I didn't know anyone but Josh. But hearing the testimonies of the students and being like, wow, these people have the same challenge they have, but they are actually overcoming them. And I've never been able to, able to overcome them. I never even thought that. I had to overcome them because I'd always seemed I was doing well as a Christian. And um, then after that, I was just like, Josh, how can I be like you guys? Like, how can I, I want to be like you guys. And he asked me to reach out to Jesse. I had ignored those first three weeks <laughs> to study the Bible. And so studying the Bible and learning about the cross and just, even though I'd always known about the cross, different it was just i'll do anything like w once i had that study i was like i'll do whatever i'll do anything right. whatever it is i'll do it and so that's, that's how i became a disciple wow okay so 
When was that? What year was that? That was in 2019. 2019. May. Okay, so you were born in 99, is that right? Right. You're 25 now. <clears throat> and you were, what, what year were you in school? I was in my, that was right at the end of my freshman year of college. Okay, okay. So you came in, you're about 20. All right. And so how, how did your college, how'd your college years go? Um, they were great. College was great. Like, uh, college was cool. I'm, I'm glad that I became a disciple early and I got to have some in, like involvement in my campus ministry because that ministry is just incredible. And it, first we had, we had COVID. And so during COVID, I was actually in, in Japan because I was doing a study abroad in Japan. And um, so after that, I had England because no one was allowed on campus. But I still got to be part of the um, campus ministry. But I got to return to this house church that I, I mentioned earlier, which used to be too bad. At this point, it was like like maybe like 20, 20 plus people, wow. not including children. And it was cool. Like now I during this COVID time, I had like a family to come be with and like raise me a little bit. And um, I got to do like an online Bible talk, GoPro and campus during that time I was at home. And then I came back to um, MIT COVID and that was just like, Jesse, Jesse Goman was still there at the time. And we had this leadership thing. And I remember him just like pouring in a lot of vision. And um, yeah, campus, that campus ministry, just a special ministry, I think. I remember in my senior year, there were all these interns who just had such dreams. They just wanted to see their campuses be, be reached. And so that was a great time. And yeah, MIT it was difficult for sure. Like homework and the demands of it were, were tough, but God just, just helped. I didn't, I didn't know. Like he just, something like that. There are I, I would dream about the answers to questions that I was in my homework, things like that. Like he's just saving me time. Like he just made it so that I could <laughs> do ministry. And it was such a, a blessing. That's great. What did you study? I studied mechanical engineering. Oh boy. That's, that's tough. Okay. So what got you interested in missionary work? I've always wanted to, wanted to travel. I think a lot of people in England, actually, they love to travel. And so we always had this idea of seeing and so going, leaving England and living in America for university was kind of my least of that. And then even during university, I got to go to different places. Like I mentioned, Japan, Brazil, Ghana, many places. And I, I've always wanted to travel. But then in terms of missionary, there was this whole like moment that, yeah, maybe I can explain that moment. And it was when I was with Jesse. And he, um, studying, he'd met this young man at Harvard called Patrick, with the same age, and study on Zoom because it was like still quarantine. And I remember just seeing every week, like it was very busy. Said so I only have this one hour every week to do this Bible study, and we we do the Bible study, and I would just be amazed by how the Bible just changed him. Like right, it was this just so cool and i remember at the end of it when he became a disciple and i got to baptize um baptize him with, after that night i was just like well like if i could do this every day i would do this and i called jesse and i just said i just want to do this like i just want to and he told me to kevin i spoke to kevin kevin was like let's like let me help you become uh, an intern and you do ministry. And so that was kind of the arc um, that set that, that dream into, a, into, into being. Yeah. So you spoke with Kevin Miller and he said, Hey, let me, let me help you out. So you got hired as an intern. Is that right? Yeah. So it was, it wasn't like paid or anything. Right. We have this intern program and there were, there were about 11 
that I did it. And so I got made as one of those interns and I got to help at MIT, Ravi, Babalola. And that was just, yeah, a great year as well. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what year did you graduate? In 22. 22. Okay. So it's been a couple of years. And then you, you, how did you become part of Revive and, and join that whole program? Yeah, so um, after I graduated, I did this program, Chance of a Lifetime. Okay. And um, I got to be with Glenn Petruzzi in the Northwest region of Boston. And that was like, like doing my dream. You know, I was doing it. And I got to be with this campus ministry. And that was great. And I enjoyed it. But I'd always had this desire to go to J Japan. I'm sure we'll talk more about, but I had a, I have a dream to go to Japan and I felt like I need to do something that's going to put me there, like going to get me ready to do that. And that year of transfer lifetime was great. And I learned so much, but I remember speaking to um, Doug Arthur actually during the crisp, like the winter break, getting some advice, next steps. And he just suggested like, trying to see how I can train to be missionary, be, be someone who can plant churches. And the Revive program was something that could do that. Um, and so I spoke to Sean, Sean encouraging, and he kind of said, either way, like Boston is great to train, Revive is great to train. I got a lot more advice and it just kind of came, became clear that I need to go and come here and do what it, do missionary work, and then I can get a little bit closer to my goal of going to Japan to be a missionary. Okay. So, um, okay. So when did you arrive in Eastern Europe and where did you go to? Where have you been? Yeah, first, I, this is my, I'm starting my second five. Last year is my first year and we were in Bucharest, Romania. Yeah. Okay. So you started like last fall, a year ago? Yes. Okay, and so this is your second year. What's been the most inspiring part of it? Like, what's what's blown your mind? Tell me, tell, tell me something that so you go, this is God at work here. Okay, I can tell you what's been the most inspiring, and then I'll share with you a story that's really cool. Um, the most inspiring thing has to be just the team dynamic. I think having a bunch of people come, leave things behind, and just be here, be fully dedicated. It's just like it's like you've taken, he like I don't want to say heaven, and the, you've taken church and you've just moved it, and everyone's working at their it's Christ like. Like it feels like everyone every day is just trying to be as much as as Christ, or and it's so evident, it's so evident, and we really all help each other do that. And so that's just the most inspiring thing for sure. And God picks the team every time, like last year, this year, he's picked the team. Um, and so that's probably the most inspiring thing. I was, one story I'd love to share is there was this um, young man, his name is Stefan. And I remember the, the day that we were reaching out, it was time to like go and meet, meet up again. And, and I just remember this feeling of like, you just ask one more person, just ask one more. And uh, Turned around, went back down the road and spoke to this this guy. And I was just like, Do you, would you be interested in about God? And he was like, yes, like, yeah, I would. And I, I told him about the Bible discussion. He pulled out his, wrote it in his notes. And he was there the next day, a Bible talk. And um, he, he had Bible talk with this kind of this dark area. He was, it was kind of sketchy a little bit. And he came and he told me, like, I thought you guys were like, like a cult or this bad like, group. <laughs> but I'm so tame. And so Stefan, he begins studying the Bible and um, he has a, a girlfriend who, very, she doesn't want to be connected with the church. She, she wants nothing to do with the church really. And for five months of studying with him, she was kind of a little bit of like a barrier for him. And um, I remember just not, just praying for her, praying for her. And five months later, I'm on a, on a like on a yeah metro underground train and our train stopped in the exact spot that him 
and his girlfriend spoken and I'd never been able to meet because she never wanted to have anything to do with us. But for some reason, the, the train literally stopped in the exact like place where they were standing. They get on the train. I'm like, whoa, this is incredible. I, I introduced myself. And then what I'm with one of the sisters and I introduced them. He, they have a conversation and she has her first Bible study the next day. Wow. She has the Bible and she starts studying the Bible. She starts seeing like, oh, this is incredible. Uh, it's amazing. And so about like a month-ish after, like maybe two months, she is getting um, baptized. She's getting baptized before him and he gets baptized week and so that was an, an incredible story mm. of just god is god working in a, in a powerful way. wow yeah why did you stay for a second year most people go back after a year mm. so i the reason oh so yeah the reason i stayed for a second year is because i really believe in being done here i really think it's just great for, for firstly for all of the volunteers and people who come i think it's great for all of the people who donate to actually help fundraise and that they can see videos and be inspired doing here and i just think it's a, a, a hope a, a chance for a city to have like a revival and i've seen it in the chat there some, some parents, their, their kids haven't shown any interest in church. Last year, there's a guy, he's about 21, he, he showed no interest in church. We came over to his house for dinner and began studying the Bible. And the amount of just joy it brings to the parents of a church that they've seen of their friends and family walk away from, um, but they've stayed. And then now you can have the people who've come to try and help it's it's very faith building for the church mm. and then for the city the, the people we've met many people like last year we we were able to see uh in people get baptized and restored how many i'm and sorry 18 one eight wow and it's just we like how would we wouldn't have met those people if that didn't happen and so it's a really a, a hope for for the city I wanted to stay to like help that, to continue that. Um, cause I really believe in what they're doing. I, I really am inspired by Sean. He, he leads the Revive team and he's a great and mentor. Um, and I think there's so much I, I want to learn from. And so I think one year didn't feel it wasn't enough. And so I'm here to learn and to practice put some of what I learned last year into practice to save save souls. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so you were in Romania last year, but this year you're in Bulgaria. Yes, and we have three teams right now. So we have a team in Moldova, it's Romania, and a team in Bulgaria. Wow, okay. If someone were interested in Revive or you know doing missionary work or they're thinking, by that, that'd be really cool, but they're a little bit afraid, a little hesitant. What advice would you give to that person? I would say definitely apply. Just because you apply doesn't mean like you're not signing anything. You don't have to, it's not a commitment yet necessarily. When you apply, it lets you really think of, like you put away the fear and you live on the faith. And so I'd say write that application send it in and two interviews you get an interview to really figure out if this is for you um but even actually the, the year before i joined revive i had applied for revive the previous year I had an interview and i i decided that i wanted to do chance for a lifetime so you have you can actually be a really good way of deciding maybe something else there's something else out there that you didn't even know that might be suited for you because you're going to speak to someone who is well connected and can help you. And so I'd say apply, um, whether you think it's afraid, whether you think it's, or whether you think maybe you're not qualified. I think anyone is, is qualified. Anyone who has a desire to serve is qualified. But whether or not you think you're qualified, I'd say send in an application. 
Okay, yeah. so send in an app. How much does a person have to raise? Like how 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 much does a person have to raise to support themselves for a year? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So we budget of around a thousand dollars per month, and so like ten thousand the minimum. But because of flights, like if you're flying back and forth from your country in Christmas, and obviously you have to fly there in the beginning and at the end, um, and it's going to be ten thousand plus whatever your flights will cost. So that will depend on where you're living. Okay. I don't want to be a disbeliever here, but it's it's hard for me to, to imagine you can live on ten thousand dollars a month in anywhere. That's crazy. Is that is that a reality? I mean, is that something that's possible? It it ten, is possible. Ten thousand per possible. year for the whole year? Like wow. Yes. Like rent is not like yeah, rent is around four hundred out of that. And then food maybe maximum 400 and then you have 200 left so it's pretty like pretty doable actually it's quite cheap that's pretty place. awesome that's fantastic okay so you told you told me you have a dream to go to japan where'd that come from and why okay just talk a little bit about that yeah so I, uh, before I became a disciple in my first year, my first semester, before that I had gone to Korea for three weeks and there was something about this like Asian culture that was like, mm, I, I would actually love more to learn more about this. And I'd already been quite interested in Japanese culture at the time. And so I was deciding, Hey, let me just learn. Maybe I'll pick a language to learn. So I picked Japanese. During that time, I got to meet many Japanese people to practice my my language skills. And whilst I was meeting all the Japanese people, I well, these people are super nice. They're very like warm, and I felt like I felt yeah connection with them. And it was something that I love to do, like like favorite things in a week was meeting this these two older women who had children. And they would come to MIT, they were speaking English, I was speaking Japanese. We do that every week. And I just felt really like careful. Um, and then I got to go to, I became a disciple. And then I got to go to Japan for two months whilst I was doing a study abroad. And I got to be part of the um, Tokyo ministry for those two months. And just the amount of love that I was shown with, just incredible. Like I remember they in Japan they celebrate this thing on Valentine's Day, actually celebrate the men. And <laughs> I hadn't been there for that long. But they have made these like encouragement cards and snacks for me. And I felt whoa, like like they I'm not like a burden to them, but they're really welcoming me here. And so I remember feeling loved by them and just you know how Japanese people are, how they can be very like kind and almost like overly kind. Like you're not even sure, like, are you being real? Like you, are you right. really going to be kind? And when I first got to Japan, I didn't have any signal or data. I was trying to find my combo and so many people were willing to like walk with me and show me the way and try I, as much Japanese as I could, but I couldn't speak that great Japanese and yet people were being so patient. So I just felt, very like I had a great time when I was there and um, I always desired to be there for some amount of time and then learning about how like in Japan it's what Christian like one percent technically one percent and you can just people who have not heard about Jesus there are many people who they don't have a friend who is they that if they wanted to know about about Christianity, it would be difficult for them to. And so I thought this needs to happen. Like people need to get in this country with people like this, they need to hear the gospel. Like mm. it needs to be to bread. And so that's really what um, engaged my desire to go to Japan and, and help spread the gospel and make disciples there or make disciples there. And so I've been behind that. 
Yeah, that's exciting. So you're in Eastern Europe now. What are your plans to get to Japan? Do you have a timeline? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm definitely still praying about that. Um, and I think even speaking with you, Rob, was, was a great, Rob shared some great like knowledge and advice with me. I need to like think more, but I'm hoping that within the next two or three years, I'll be able to go to Japan and spend some significant time there learning more of the language, learning the culture and making connections with the people who were there so that I can like really know exactly, maybe not exactly more about what it is that I'm trying to do and knowing of that could be opened for me to accomplish this dream that I have. Um, so I will either, yeah, either go there and work with the church regions, uh, maybe as a volunteer or maybe somehow as an intern. Or the, the other idea is that we revive what we are hoping for one day is to like revive, not just in Eastern Europe, but if it could be replicated in other nations, mm -hmm. I think some people might even feel like America might need, some churches in America might need a revival. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So if I could kind of use what I've been learning to model, the apply revive to another region, to another nation, I think that could be even big. Japan, it could end up going all, all over the world and giving people an opportunity to not just do like a one year challenge where you're isolated, that could be difficult to do it with a team. You can do it with it, like in the encouragement of having um, a community push you and help you. And it also gives people more opportunities to give. And what I've learned from these past two years is that people love to give more than, more than you expect. That, yeah. That's awesome. Well, where, where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah, in five years. Uh, yeah, okay. So in five years, I see my being in a region in Japan where in, um, people being made into disciples, there have been people who just want to go into ministry. They want to be serving. They want to be interns. And people have dreams of going to other regions in Japan and planting churches. I see church that has people who have come to help from other countries um, in over the world, and they've they've given up time to come and help build a church here in whichever I'm in. But also local people who are getting vision of them going and helping their own country. Uh, but yeah, in the next five years, I I really pray. I often pray, and I I'm in Japan, mm -hmm. and that God is. And God always works, so I have no doubt that. I pray that I can be in Japan. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now tell if you don't mind, tell me, are you are you dating right now or are you what what's up with your uh, romantic status? Yeah, I'm single. Okay. No, no dating. Never dated anyone in since I've become a disciple. Okay. Do you have plans to to get married? Do you or do you plan on staying single? I, I think um, enjoy, I feel like I thrive being single, and so I don't have any plans of being married, um, but I am open to whatever God has. I wouldn't have a, I, I only want to what pleases God, and I think that right now being single is that I can do I, is the way that I can best please God with my life mm. and a, the, the path that I'm going down. That's awesome. Yeah. Japan is known as like the Mount Everest of mission fields. I mean, it's, it's a tough field. We spent 10 years there. It's, it's challenging. How do you stay fired up being on the mission field? Like what are you doing to keep your relationship with God burning brightly? Mm. Yeah, I think, I 
I think for, for me, uh, I have this need. I have, I genuinely feel like upset or a little bit irritated with um, the lostness in the world. I, I really feel as though when I see someone and I, I see them, I'm like, listen, they're just sat down on the bus, but they could, I, I need to tell them what, mm. about who God is. Like, I need to. And Jesus came, that, like, he, he came to seek and the lost. And I've been a recipient of that salvation. And I feel as though if I want to actually say anything, it would be like, I feel bad or guilty when I don't. And so I, I'm inspired by the need. There's just every, so many people are lost and um, the, the road to, is narrow. Even when someone gets in a Bible study, they're one of those four soils like you don't know. And so there's just such a need. And so that's one way that I, I'm inspired. But I think the other way is just um, sometimes it's easy to, to not be, it's easy to let yourself not be inspired when, when you have lessons that are very like, like they, they get you to go out and evangelize, they get you to want to change your life and do things like this. Try and tell myself to be inspired, to let myself be inspired. And to make action and i love what all of the things that you share on your like in your like in your book actually and things about setting setting targets for yourself having people to hold you accountable i already know how i want to live but it doesn't mean that i always do that right but having things written down having goals for myself and having people who can hold me accountable really helps me to do that that's awesome how do your parents feel about what you're doing? How do my parents feel? <laughs> I think uh, at first, because when I picked to do lifetime, time, um, I was considering doing a master's and they were thinking I should do the master's. And then I picked, I said, oh, I'll do chance of a lifetime and then I'll do the master's after. Like I have that. But I think that they're happy. They, they came to visit Romania this year when I was there and they were really like very proud I think of what was being done and they often say like the the, the work I'm doing is good like it, it is the most important thing I think they feel very proud of me and I'm very grateful for that that's awesome that's awesome Kalade, if the person wanted to support you, encourage you, help you, how would they reach you and how could they, how could they support what you're doing? Yeah, so if you wanted to support me, I think um, the best way to do is to email me at um, Kalade uh, PA, as you know, it's Kalade A at gmail.com and you can just send me an email. Okay. I'll, I'll include that in the show notes. Thank you. I would love to talk and um, it'd be praying. And I have, a, I have an Instagram account where I post this and um, I try and inspire people to, to push themselves. My Instagram is called Colade in Christ. And it's, yeah, I, people can be inspired from that. So yeah, the, prayers and just reaching out and I, all, all of these dreams and ambitions to go to Japan will definitely require of finance, financial support. And so any amount of support, like anyone wants to give towards that would be much appreciated. And when I go to Japan, I have a team and I desire to have like a group of people who will go and I already know some people who would want to come on that team. And if you're someone listening right now, you feel as though you are someone who would want to do this and want to go and help spread the gospel in Japan, reach out. And um, we will build a team and we will go. And it's definitely happen if it's God's will. And I believe it is God's will. So yeah, thank that, you. 
That is awesome. I love that spirit. Thank you so much for your time, Kaladay, and all the best to you in Hello. Europe and Japan and wherever else God may take you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Here's how you can help support the program. First, let your friends know about the podcast. Secondly, read and review one of my books, either How to Plant and Grow a Church or Courage, How to Make This Life Count. You can find those on Amazon. If you've already read them, please give me a review. It just helps people to be able to find the books and locate it. There's a lot of books out there. Finally, support the program with a gift today. The link is in the show notes because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.